So again, thank you for attending the North American Lecture Tour here today. And without further ado, we're going to start off with the first speaker. He is the son of the president and founder of Alltech Incorporated, who is Dr. Pierce Lines. Please welcome Dr. Mark Lines. They say, you know, if you can't get a job anywhere, I guess you come back home, right? <laughs> Um, but I actually, last year, uh, as you could see, was a very, very exciting year for us. And personally, it was a very exciting year for me. I actually had 10 years in Alltech, and, um, and it, was, it was quite an exciting thing at our Christmas celebration um, that I actually got our 10-year pin. <laughs> and in Alltech, it's a very special thing, and I've learned, uh, some of you might know my older cousin who works in the company, I've learned from him, I don't bring my Alltech pin, my 10-year pin with me keep the old one because he's lost about three or four of them. So um, I'm very excited to be here. This is our first stop, as you heard, of our lecture tour. We're going to go all around the world um, with this message, and the message kind of changes. So if you end up somewhere else, you might hear a slightly different message. And why is that? It's because we do these lecture tours as much to learn as we do to educate. For some of you who might know all tech, we talk about marketing through education. Our products aren't always obvious, how to use them, why to use them. Sometimes the concepts are a little bit different. So we say we have to educate people, and that's how we sell. But it's also to learn from you, to learn what the industry issues are. So we can bring those back home, work on those, and come back with solutions. AgConnect is, is quite an interesting meeting for us to, to show up at. It's a little bit different. Um, how many people are here for the AgConnect meeting? And how many are here for Farm Bureau? So we got a pretty good breakdown. How many people work in beef? What about dairy? Anybody in poultry? Swine? Not too many. So we've got, we've got a very nice cross-section of the industry. And I think what you'll see through these concepts is we're talking about things that I think are very, very relevant to all sectors, and they're also very relevant to us as consumers, us as part of the human uh, species. So we've talked about this of feeding the world, and you see a number of these things up here, sustainability, uh, a lot of different concepts. A lot of this we talked about at the Alltech FEI World Equestrian Games, at our little area. We had four acres, some of you might have seen some of it outside, and we talked about all these different things. We thought it was a great opportunity, but we had all of these people coming in, over half a million people, 600,000 people came to the event. Um, we wanted to talk to them about how food gets on their plate and, and what that means and what the issues are that, that are facing them. But just to kick this off, we have to think about a vision, a vision for 2050. And a vision is critical to any business or any industry. <coughs> and with a clear vision and a strong level of belief behind that, we can bend reality, we can create reality. But we live in a world full of challenges. And here we are, incredible year 2010. And what I like about this, in the North American context, being the director of North America, we get the first shot. We get to think about this and say, it's a blank slate, it's a new year. What are those challenges, and how do we make them opportunities? So another year, this year, or maybe next year, the world will have another billion people. So we'll hit seven billion people on this planet, probably in 2012. So we've had an incredible success, in a way, as a species. An incredible success as a human race. It took us 250,000 years to hit the first billion people. But it only took another 100 years to get to 2 billion, 33 years to hit 3, and then it really sped up. 15 years for the next billion, only 11 to get to 5 billion. 13 more years, we had 6 billion. And another 13 years now, we're going to hit 7 billion. So we hit a very fast pace, and we continued at that pace. And as we move forward, a further 13 years, we're expected to hit 8 billion. And then things <coughs> kind of slow down. But that's a very significant number of people to have. 20 to 25 years after that, we'll hit 9 billion people on this planet. And then things should taper off. The expectation is, as people have more money, they tend to have fewer children. We should plateau as a population, as a global population. 
But having said that, we're already feeling a lot of the strains of having a large population, having so many different things happening, having people who have different needs. We've, we've talked in many other lecture tours about the amount of meat that people eat as their income goes up, their meat consumption goes up. So therefore, requirement for grains, requirement for the, for the food industry increases. We have to imagine a future, a future for the children of today, where actually there may not be one. And we've seen that certainly. One of the very personal experiences we had this year was in, in last year, was in Haiti. We went down to Haiti, I guess it was the end of, of, of January last year for the first time. And uh, Dr. Lyons actually went down to Haiti eight times last year, got very involved in uh, setting up a project there. And this really impacted him seeing children there and, and, and meeting them and seeing their smiling faces and thinking, do they really have a future? We also talked about a world of water. I was, we were in, um, our family's originally from Ireland. We, went, we go back to Ireland every Christmas. And it was very strange to be in Dublin and see signs that said, caution, water shortages, please use water sparingly in a country where it rains basically every day. But that's because we had a freeze, pipe burst, and there was a huge amount of water being wasted, this is, the, this is the reality, perhaps, of the future, that water is suddenly a very precious resource. One day there's water, the next day there isn't. There's huge changes going on in the world. Rising seas in some places, yet droughts in others. The droughts that we're looking at in South America are going to change the landscape and really define what happens with grain prices this coming year. So we're facing a thirsty world, Yet in other situations, we use over 2 billion gallons of water to water our golf courses every day. And in other places, just to buy, buy a bag, a plastic bag of water is a commodity, buying a bag of water for 10 cents. Traceability is something that was kind of a buzzword a few years ago. Today, it's really a reality. Are we what we eat or what we are? Are we what our animals ate? At the same time, we know that we have a situation where we have drug residues. We have a lot of concerns about this. We have a lot of people very anxious about this in political sectors today, wondering about antibiotics and how they should be controlled. And we continue to compound our problems. Last year, of course, saw the crisis in the Gulf. Another you know, huge amount of attention going to the oil spill. At the same time, that's something that happens in so many parts of the world every day things that we don't necessarily trace. We think about petroleum, and we have this whole discussion of having enough reserves or not. At the same time, we have experts in these areas saying that gas prices are likely to hit something like $5 in the not so distant future. Will that be before we have those 7 billion people or after? So should we be concerned? We look at what's happening I've, I've talked to a number of people in the, in the grain area. And if you look at the price of corn, as many of you obviously often do, what used to be the ceiling price in corn is now the floor price. It really is never going to get below that again, at least if things continue. And we sometimes have, we make policies in one place of the world that don't make sense everywhere. We have a chain reaction. We have corn going to biofuels. Therefore, a switch from soybean to corn, corn being more attractive for U.S. farmers. Therefore, Brazilian farmers producing more, more soy to satisfy that demand and pushing, in this case, perhaps beef production further and further into the Amazon state and perhaps even to the Amazon forest. This was interesting. I, I caught this, if you can read it up here, the Philanthropic News Digest just came out on the 6th. And it's interesting to think of the world of philanthropy talking about food prices and how much this is affecting what they can do, how charities can actually get aid out because food costs so much. And their expectations being that food prices will continue to go up all through this year and beyond. And why is this happening? Because of market speculation, bad, out, bad weather or changing weather, weaker Weak output from poor countries, obviously the increase in oil prices, 
wheat prices, etc. And we have to think just back to 2008, when we had such fluctuations in food prices, what happened? We saw food riots in Haiti, Egypt, Cameroon, a number of other countries as well. So we have a, a world that needs to be fed. This issue of 2050 isn't an issue of 40 years from now, it's an issue of today. What will happen when the war, when we're fighting over the grains, between fuel, between food, and could grain prices going to, could the price of grain increasing because of our use of biofuels and a number of other areas end up starving the world? Once upon a time, we started to talk about greenhouse gases like this was some idea that was in the long distant future. Today, we can already see some of those changes happening. We face a situation that 25% of the species on the planet could face extinction, extinction in the next 40 years. And the temperatures could begin to, to rise globally at the same time. So just mentioned in Ireland, they're expecting colder and colder weather there. The weather patterns are changing. They're, gonna, they're calling it a mini ice age. That's, that's what we have to expect from climate change. So is this a world of hope or a world of hopelessness? Well, in the eyes of every mother, it has to be a world of hope, the hope that they put in their children and their children's future. Mothers don't see that brick wall. They see a way around it. So we have to think of this as a world of opportunities, not problems. And those opportunities for us will be built on technology. We have 9.3 billion people coming for dinner. We had a green revolution that got us here incredible impact that the production of nitrogen had and getting nitrogen into our soils through fertilizer and all sorts of other things sustained that massive population growth that we had. Now perhaps we need another green revolution, but one that brings in and really sees all the unexpected, unseen ramifications and that we really protect the animal, the consumer, and the environment. So what's holding us back? What's holding us back from this leap of faith to adopt and embrace technology. Well, these are different technologies, some of which we're going to be talking about today. These technologies will help enable us to convert these problems into opportunities, the true opportunities that they are. So we're at that crossroads of challenges and opportunities.